welcome to Intro 101. My name is Chris, and I am your neuroscience and psychology graduate student assistant. I'm here to assist you with the related science basics that you interact with on a daily basis. Now, the other day, I posted excerpts from this channel that hopefully helped bring a little more context to information Dr. Brian Suterer explained in his post on chromosomal and genetic anomalies that underlie the complexities of biological gonadal determination and the impact on stereoidogenic hormone development as it related to the women's boxing controversy at the Paris Olympics. Since then, OBGYN Dr. Karen Tang posted related content. Among many relevant points, she mentioned those who have ovaries can have elevated levels of testosterone. In this part two response, I've added an excerpt from my episode on gametogenesis that explains how ovarian follicles convert androgens to estrogen and how this can become dysregulated leading to elevated levels of testosterone and medical disorders like polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS. PCOS can affect up to 20% of reproductive aged women worldwide, and about 70% of those affected go undiagnosed. Something to think about. I'll put a link in the show notes to Dr. Tang's post related to the Paris Olympics women's boxing controversy, and another excellent video in which she explains biological sex versus gender. I'll also post the full episode I've pulled my excerpt from if you'd like to learn more about brain and body physiology and development. As always, thank you for watching and take care out there. So let's follow one cohort of primordial follicles and their development all the way from recruitment to ovulation with the gentle reminder that many cohorts will be at varying stages of follicular genesis at any one time at the onset of puberty. Now this may seem like a lot of detail, but a basic understanding of follicular development not only takes us to the cellular level of this paradoxically beautiful and also slightly mean process that affects nearly half the world's population, but it also provides context to those who may be experiencing ovarian dysfunction, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome also known as PCOS. PCOS is the result of dysregulated androgen hormone production that interferes with follicular growth. This level of detail may also be helpful for those who are receiving medically assisted fertility treatments that induce ovulation. Also, you may also just wish to understand just how busy and complex ovaries are. Okay, so back to our cohort of primordial follicles. So again, very nearly one year before this cohort will have narrowed down to one dominant follicle that will release an oocyte into the wild, that is the fallopian tube. This particular cohort is recruited from the entire pool of hundreds of thousands of resting primordial follicles. The mechanism responsible for cohort recruitment isn't fully understood, but it does have me curious why these particular primordial follicles of all the follicles that could be recruited at that time? Are they specifically selected or is it just by chance that this grouping becomes activated? Well, what we kind of know from animal models is that recruitment involves a lot of crosstalk between intra-ovarian regulators. Intra-ovarian regulators are signaling proteins and chemical messengers, such as growth factors, cytokines, even neuropeptides, that are both generated and expressed within the ovary. Neuropeptides are usually found in abundance in the nervous system, so it's a little curious that they are also produced and expressed inside the ovary. However, there is evidence that at least one group of neuropeptides may have a significant role in folliculogenesis, and it is initiated within the ovary. Anyway, these intra-ovarian regulators are very chatty. They are actually hard at work all of the time, but they have specific communication and feedback patterns during recruitment. And one intraovarian growth factor in particular, called growth differentiation factor 9, or GDF9, and its expression appears to have a major role in recruitment. I don't know what causes its expression for recruitment, but what I find most interesting is that it's the oocyte itself within the follicle that produces and secretes GDF9. So it might be that the oocyte, as it expresses GDF9, it's volunteering itself for recruitment, and the other regulators possibly determine its readiness, or assist in its recruitment. I'm not sure, maybe both. There's a lot left to understand at this stage of folliculogenesis. 
but I think we can get away with saying that a few oocytes send out GDF9 signals and the other regulators receive the call and work together through multiple signaling pathways and complex homeostatic feedback loops to initiate the next step in follicular growth. I won't get into all of the signaling pathways and complex homeostatic feedback loops because it's well beyond introductory level instruction. But if I can leave you with an image that I think might be representative of the level of molecular activity and cellular communication going on inside the ovaries and between the ovaries, the central nervous system and the endocrine system, imagine what the buzz of communication is like in an air traffic control tower at international travel hubs like Chicago O'Hare or Dubai airports. Very chatty, loads of crosstalk. Absolutely necessary to keep everything moving in an efficient and orchestrated manner. Because remember, there are actually multiple cohorts of follicles working their way through varying stages of follicular genesis, continuously from puberty to menopause. So if you ever have the good fortune to witness planes take off and land at a very busy airport, think of the hardworking ovary. Okay, So now we have our recruited or possibly volunteer cohort of primordial follicles. And the next step in follicular genesis is follicular growth. The intra-ovarian regulators also stimulate different stages of follicle growth and will be the primary growth source for a long time before sources from outside the ovary lend a hand. At this stage, the intra-ovarian regulators stimulate the granulosa cells that surround the primordial follicle to change shape and divide and proliferate to form multiple layers of cells around the oocyte. At the same time, a glycoprotein layer that is possibly synthesized and secreted by the oocyte forms between the oocyte and the granulosa cells. It's called the zona pellucida, and it remains with the oocyte even after ovulation and helps facilitate fertilization later if there is contact with sperm cells. The oocyte itself is also growing, and has all kinds of business kicking off inside its genome that will contribute to its growth and its communication with the other cells within the follicle. So with the growing stratified layers of granulosa cells and the growing oocyte and the addition of zona pellucida, the follicles in this cohort have shifted from primordial status to primary or preantral follicle status. Preantral will make more sense in a minute. During the preantral stage, the granulosa cells continue to divide, and as they do, they develop a follicle-stimulating hormone receptors. Also during this stage, the oocyte secretes more of that magic GDF9 to recruit support cells called theca cells, which are a kind of interstitial cell, and they form the outermost layer of the follicle. There, they differentiate into two types of theca interstitial cells with luteinizing hormone receptors. Together, theca cells work with granulosa cells to produce estrogen hormones. An important side note is that both the granulosa and theca cells are very much like other cells and that they have many of the standard components, like a nucleus and mitochondria. And that's important to know because if you remember, mitochondria contain a self-destruct button, which initiates apoptosis or programmed cell death. And this will be handy to remember when we get to later stages of follicular development, when all but one of the follicles in the cohort will degenerate. Also important to note is that similarly to what's happening at puberty in the sperm generating counterpart's nervous system, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis in females and those with ovaries reaches maturation. And if you remember, this is the point of maturity when the hypothalamus starts releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone in pulses and this signals to the anterior pituitary gland to release FSH and luteinizing hormone. Now, it's not super clear at which stage the follicle goes from intra-ovarian regulator-dependent growth to gonadotropin-dependent growth, but there is some evidence that FSH begins influencing growth during the preantral follicle stage as the granulosa cells develop FSH receptors. And there is also evidence that it isn't until the next stage that the follicle becomes less reliant on intra-ovarian regulators and more reliant on gonadotropin hormones to facilitate growth and maturation. Either way, once the follicle has a fully formed theca interstitial cell layer, the follicle shifts from a primary or preantral follicle to a secondary follicle. 
And once it has formed the theca cell layer, the follicle can start producing estrogen. And to do so, it needs luteinizing hormone to stimulate the production of androgens in the theca interstitial cells. And then they secrete the androgens and they diffuse across the basal lamina to the granulosa cells. And there it will convert to estrogen with the help of an enzyme called aromatase, which is stimulated into production by FSH. So again, theca cells have luteinizing hormone receptors, which stimulate the production of androgens. And granulosa cells have FSH receptors, and FSH stimulates the production of the enzyme aromatase, which is needed to convert the androgens from the theca cells into estrogen in the granulosa cells. This is particularly noteworthy if you are someone who has or knows someone who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, or again, PCOS. PCOS is characterized by excessive production of androgens in the ovaries, and this may be due to much higher concentrations of luteinizing hormone reaching follicular thecal cells. This leads to the theca cells producing excessive amounts of androgen, while the granulosa cells aren't getting enough FSH to produce enough aromatase to convert all of those androgens into estrogen. This particular aspect of PCOS pathophysiology is possibly due to abnormally rapid pulsing of gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, causing it to release skewed ratios of LH to FSH. What results from this androgen overproduction in the follicles is that they can't grow beyond the gonadotropin-independent stage. When follicles become dependent on proper LH to FSH ratios in the antral stage, their ability to grow and mature and become viable egg cells is thwarted when those ratios are dysregulated. The follicles will remain immature and accumulate in the ovary. There are other physiological conditions that contribute to the development of PCOS, and if you're interested in learning more about it, I posted a recent review in the show notes on what is currently understood about its development. Okay, lovelies, that's all for this episode. Thank you all for being here. Again, please check out the STEM organizations in the show notes and support them or others in any way that you are able. I have no relationship with these organizations. I'm just a fan of the work they're doing, and I hope that you will be too. If you like this episode, please click like and subscribe and the notification bell if you haven't already. And please share it with your friends, neighbors, and family and anyone who you think would benefit from understanding their body a little better. Until next time, take care out there.